Okay, it's a great pleasure to introduce Shankho uh, Banerjee. He's currently a CERN fellow and uh, he has worked on various aspects of the phenomenology of uh, beyond standard model physics. And currently, of course, it is quite exciting because we know that uh, there are some hints that indeed such a thing is, is, it does exist. So, uh, so we are very ex uh, happy to hear from Shankho today about his research in this particular field uh, and a more general broad introduction to this field. Okay, Shankho, then over to you now. Yeah. Okay, so thanks, Ayanda, and uh, thanks uh, for this invitation. And I'm like, I wish I could have been there in person. So uh, the title of my talk is a bit vague, various directions, like various, I haven't quantified it. I hope I'll be able to quantify some of the directions in which I've been working on. So it's based on various works. I'll, I'll show along what, what I've, I've been uh, uh, working on uh, as we go along. So this is the vague plan of my talk. So I'll essentially start with a very, very brief, concise introduction of standard model effective field theory, why we need it, the requirement and the necessity for precision physics, like how precise we want to measure something and how and why, and what is the importance and the ramifications of precision physics. Then I will go on to the Higgs self-coupling to understand, to better understand the standard model scalar potential. So through the double Higgs sector, and then I will touch upon, though briefly, into uh, some aspects of dark matter physics, some aspects of higher order co corrections and perturbation theory. And in one slide or two, I'll very briefly talk about long lived particles, the signatures and lifetimes studies. So uh, let's get on. So the story so far that we know from the, the standard model sector, so what we know for sure is that the standard model is an excellent theory, the standard model of particle physics, not the cosmology, it's a different standard model. The standard model of particle physics is an excellent theory and it has been validated over the years. And as you all know, uh, the last particle which was discovered in the standard model sector was in 2012. It was the scalar boson, the only scalar boson in the theory, which is the Higgs boson. So the other particles, the quarks, the leptons, and the mediators, they were all discovered previously. So because Higgs is a particle, so we, we must see its signature. So the Higgs was seen in various channels uh, at the LHC, both by the CMS as well as the ATLAS collaborations. So it was dominantly seen in two of these channels in the diphoton channel. So the plot is a bit small, but I'll, I'll read out. So this is the invariant mass. So when the Higgs can be reconstructed from its decay particle. So the Higgs being an unstable particle, it decays to various particles. So one can reconstruct the mass of the Higgs boson through uh, the final state particles, the final state objects. So here we see that one can reconstruct the Higgs mass at around 125 giga electron volts. The same was also reconstructed in the four lep lepton channel. So here you see that a very nice peak of the Higgs boson. So we also see that there is a peak here around 90 giga electron volts. And this is essentially the Z boson. So at uh, the proton-proton colliders, the Higgs is produced in a various number of ways. So some of the most dominant ones here I have listed through Feynman diagrams. So here the Higgs is produced via two gluons fusing via top quarks or bottom quarks loops, top quarks and bottom quarks loops to, to produce a Higgs boson. This is called a weak boson fusion where two quarks, they fuse they, this via a W boson or a Z boson to produce a Higgs boson along with two other quarks. Then the Higgs can also be produced with a W and a Z boson or with a pair of top quarks. So these are the dominant production modes of the Higgs at proton-proton colliders. There are more channels, which I'm not talking about here. So as I said before that the Higgs is not a stable particle. And because it's not a stable particle, it decays promptly to various of these final states. For example, it can decay to a pair, a pair of B quarks, to a pair of tau leptons, to a pair of C quarks, to a pair of W, W, Z, Z, and so on and so forth, to a pair of diphotons, so because we are at this mass 
of 125 giga electron volts, we have the Higgs decaying to these various final states in varying proportions. And these are called the branching ratios. So depending on the mass of the final state particle, like whether it's a B quark, whether it's a W boson, we will actually know whether both these particles are produced on shell or whether there are some off shellness in these particles. Uh, very recently, just about a month ago, so we have seen the Higgs being discovered in, in a plethora of these channels. However, the Higgs has not been discovered in all its channels. So for example, we saw the Higgs, the an evidence of the Higgs boson in the two lepton plus photon channel. So in the two lepton plus photon channel, we, say, we saw an excess, actually the Atlas collaboration only saw this excess. And one, it still has not been completely discovered, but it's an evidence and more data needs to be accumulated before convincing ourselves that this is indeed what that's a signature. So uh, there is, there's a property called the CP quantum property of every particle. So for now, what we know is that the Higgs boson that has been discovered is a CP even spin zero particle. And a spin odd hypothesis is like strongly disfavored. Uh, on the other note, we still need to measure the Higgs in a Z photon channel to a pair of muons. We also need to understand the Higgs scalar, scalar sector in terms of its self couplings. So just as an aside, as uh, Ayunda was mentioning about like BSM physics. Uh, so right now we have a very good, uh, we have a very good significance of a flavor physics object called RK. Uh, and we saw that we, we can see that over the years, more and more experiments are consolidating its, uh, its ex this is excess. And at the, at the very recent, the LHCB collaboration has given a 3.1 sigma excess uh, over the standard model expectation. So more time will tell us uh, whether we really have it, uh, but as we can kind of know that this is not a statistical fluke and it will probably stay. So uh, this Uncle, is- Can I ask something? So, yes. so what is the real goal of, uh, or what can we learn from all this uh, branching ratios of various Higgs decay channels? Is it a better confirmation of the standard model? That's uh, that's what we want to do. Yes. So in standard model, so th th these plot, this plot is essentially a standard model plot. So in standard model, the theory the ex exactly predicts how much the Higgs couples or how much a particle couples to other particles. So we know from standard model its decay width. So a Higgs decaying to a pair of B quarks. We know exactly how much it is in terms of length. So we want to confirm these numbers through experiments. So we know that the branching ratio of Higgs to a pair of B quarks is like 58% from standard model for a mass of 125 GeV. So now we want to look at the experiments, whether it is exactly 58%, whether it's less, whether it's more. I'm just giving a pair of bottom quarks as an example. So given whether or not we match with the theoretical expectations, we will be able to say that, okay, this coupling is probably not exactly the, like standard model. There are some deviations. What are, these, what are the causes of these deviations? Can it just be a rescaling of a coupling? Can it be because of some higher uh, mass physics that is having its effect on low energy physics? So that is basically the topic of the effective field theory, which I'll be moving on to very shortly. So does that answer your question? Yes, yes, yes. thanks. Yeah. So I, I also had a question, sorry, on this slide. Sure, sure Jim. I, I hadn't actually caught up with this result for the dileptons and the photon for the Higgs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, but this is entirely expected, right? And yeah. that, that you'd have a radiation from one of the final state leptons. But, but what, what, what uh, is there any particular new physics or Higgs property that one gets from this decay channel yeah. that uh, that it that's just beyond just checking that you know your yeah. radiative corrections are correct? Right. So for now, so Higgs going to die photon, a die lepton plus photon can come about from two processes. One is a Z and a photon, which is this one. So the Higgs decays via a top loop or a W boson loop to a Z and a photon and the Z decays to a pair of leptons, or else one can have a photon and 
an off-shell photon, which is like a photon star, which gives rise to two leptons. So uh, the, the analysis that ATLAS performed is for, not for a Z photon, but for a gamma star gamma. So the thing is that for such processes, so I wrote to Atlas to give them, give me like more details. So they have a publication already, but they do not show all the plots. And they said that they will give it in a subsequent publication. So the reason to understand these loop processes is that, so here we should see that a gluon gluon is producing a Higgs. Now, instead of the top loop, if we had some heavy top partners or something else, some uncolored particles, the rate of the Higgs would change the production. Similarly, for the Z photon production or the photon photon production or the photon star photon production. So the importance of measuring these channels is that we really want to know whether they, uh, they conform with the standard model exactly or whether there are deviations to know whether there is something funny going on in the loop. So that's the main reason, like whether there are new particles. So new particles, if they are very heavy, they can actually like we may not be able to see them directly like through any uh, resonance, but we may be able to see their effects through some loop corrections. So that's one of the important effects. So till now, this is this, this exactly uh, agrees within the standard model expectations, but uh, more like it's not exactly okay. the standard model, but within error bars, it's- uh, no, that, 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 that I understand, but I, so, so what you're saying is actually the dominant process is like the, the Higgs to two photon. Yeah. But now one photon is internally converting to dileptons. Exactly. But well, so, but that, that, you know, by studying Higgs to two photons where there are much larger statistics, we already know that that agrees very well, right? With what one expects from the top loop. So I'm just trying to understand what the extra yeah. is yes. from having the internal conversion. Exactly. The, the extra thing is that, first of all, like, uh, like we, we know that, for example, uh, as an aside, so we know that in standard model, the triple Higgs coupling and the quartic Higgs coupling are related by a vacuum expectation value, right? So if we measure the triple Higgs coupling, we can know the quartic Higgs, Higgs coupling. Even by knowing the mass of the Higgs, we should know about the, the triple Higgs coupling, but still we want to know whether the standard model is followed exactly. So we want to measure each of these separately such that we can act actually confirm that all our relations in standard model hold. So the, the importance of studying the LL gamma channel is actually to know whether there are any other effects other than the internal conversion of photon. It could be something like a dark photon so there are theories which 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 uh, which have dark photons in them. It can be something else, uh, which which can decay to, to a pair of two leptons. So whether it exactly agrees with standard model would actually give us a second proof that okay, this is essentially Higgs going to gamma gamma, and we are essentially studying it. We are again confirming it again through a different channel. So that's the motivation I would think. Okay, so one could have like some Z prime or some extra exactly some Z prime. Okay, okay, exactly, okay. I'm, exactly. I've got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So uh, coming to, uh, in the same vein, so this is something that uh, the, the experimental uh, colleagues of ours have given us. This is called the signal strength. So the signal strength essentially quantifies uh, an observation from the experiments uh, to the standard model expectation. So the, here, for instance, I show two plots from Atlas and CMS in various production channels as well as DK channels. So here you, I showed you like the production channels are gluon fusion, weak boson fusion, associated production and top top associated production. So here you see that there are these various channels. So the line passing through unity actually shows that these exactly fall on the standard model expectations. And the error bars actually show that, okay, so the, the, sta the standard model is, is, is included in these error bars, but there are still some deviations allowed through the experiments. So what we want to know at the end of the run of the LHC or even some future colliders is that whether these error bars actually shrink more and more such that we exactly conform with the standard model expectations or whether there are like deviations which are completely away from this line. So for example, this VVF ZZ line, you can see here it's the, even the central value is not included in the standard model line. So, so some like, if someone wants to like do an ambulance chase, they would say, oh, there's a BSM physics here. But one needs to actually see what kind of cross sections one is 
like uh, one is checking here, like one one is like getting into the VVF ZZ star. So it's a very small cross section. So there is not enough data for us at the moment to actually uh, say that this is a real excess. This could very well be uh, uh, a statistical uh, fluctuation. So that's something that we need to understand, like whether these lines exactly fall within standard model expectations after a lot of data has been collected or whether we have some deviations uh, at the end of the day. So, uh, so that's the reason that we need to uh, understand precision physics very well so that we can actually say whether, okay, so we have some deviations. This can be the reason of the deviation and let's look into it more carefully. So uh, now, now coming to the motivations for effective field theory. So we know that, the, as I said, the standard model is an excellent theory, but however, it's like, like many other things, it's not a perfect and a complete theory. So there are many, many theoretical as well as experimental conditions that do not support the standard model. For instance, uh, in standard model, the neutrinos are deemed to be massless particles. However, we know that the neutrinos are not actually massless they have tiny masses, even though we do not know their exact masses. However, through oscillation experiments, through various other experiments, we know that the, there are difference in the squares of the masses of the neutrinos. We do not know the exact masses, but we still know that they, they have masses. Also, the standard model doesn't uh, allow the concept of a dark matter particle. So we, do not, we know from astrophysical as well as like cosmological evidences that dark matter exists. I will touch upon it in more details, like through galaxy rotation curves, through cos cosmic microwave background radiation, and so on and so, on and so forth. So stand standard model doesn't predict a dark matter candidate. Similarly, we know that there are more matter in our universe than antimatter. Standard model doesn't account for all of this matter-antimatter discrepancy. There's some, there, there are many other reasons. Also, like in terms of theoretical requirements, we have this so-called gauge hierarchy. The gauge hierarchy essentially says that like why, the, the, why we cannot like very, why we cannot have a Higgs mass correction in standard model completely. Like it's, it's very difficult to compute a Higgs mass, squared, Higgs mass correction in standard model because the quantum corrections are extremely huge. So we need something else, some other theory in order to, reg in order to regularize this. So there are many such candidates of which the supersymmetry is one of them. However, as we know, we haven't found any supersymmetric evidence till now. So what it is, we do not know. However, th these are like considerations that go in saying that the standard model may not be a perfect or a complete theory. So usually to address many of these questions, sometimes all of these together, sometimes some of these uh, at the same time. So there are several approaches. One is a model dependent approach where like people take a, a UV complete model or a simplified model and study all its signatures very, very carefully and say, okay, here are my are our predictions. And this is, these are the predictions and these match with the experiments. And the other thing is that like, it's a, a complete ignorance. So we, we say that, okay, we do not know what our big theory is. We, we are unaware of what the big theory is. And what we do is we take the standard model or whatever theory we are considering as a low energy effective field theory, which is an effective field theory of a very big theory. Big by big, I mean, which is valid above a very high cutoff scale, say Lambda. So this big theory that we are not aware of, uh, of can be either weakly coupled or strongly coupled or moderately coupled. We do not know what it is. However, we can parameterize our ignorance through these effective field theories. So at the outset, I must like tell you that uh, an effective field theory is not a replacement for a full theory. It's essentially a set of tools which guides us into what kind of new physics we can be looking at. So for example, here you can see that upon considering an effective field theory. So we are plotting a distribution, say some mass, some, we are plotting a mass, inv an invariant mass, and the effective field theory actually gives us some excess in the high energy tails of these distributions. So it, it can be the effect of a, a fat resonance sitting here that gives us rise to this, these discrepancies. It can also give rise to some angular differences compared to standard model expectations and so on and so forth. 
Uh, there are many ways to actually address effective field theory. There are the bottom-up approach, the top-down approach, and so on and so forth. I'm not going into so much details right now. So uh, effective field theory can also be parametrized in terms of linear effective field theory or nonlinear effective field theory. Throughout this talk, at least mostly, I'll be talking about linear effective field theories, where the, the effective field theory can be written down as a Lagrangian of the lowest order, which is, in our case, the standard model, and an incremental rise in the dimension of mass. So one can write it as so standard model is at dimension mass dimension four. One can write operators at mass dimension five, six, and so on and so forth. So it can be written as a series, and all of these uh, all of these operators will be uh, will be suppressed by a coefficient which is like this f by lambda to the power d minus four, where d is the dimension of the, the operator. So uh, coming to the first part of precision physics here. So I will essentially like stop me at any point if you have questions, if it gets too technical. So I'll be discussing the precision physics in the gauge Higgs sector. So there are many ways to produce the Higgs as I was telling you about, like for example, through with, with another W boson or a Z boson with two quarks. So this is called the Higgs Strahlung process and this is called the weak boson process. However, by introducing effective field theory operators, one gets deformations at various vertices. So for example, we have this quark quark W or the quark quark Z vertex. However, on the introduction of effective field theory, this vertex can get modified. Similarly, in standard model, we have a W W Higgs or a Z Z Higgs vertex. Again, this vertex can be modified. In standard model, we do not have any such vertex like quark quark W Higgs or quark quark Z Higgs. Some of these effective vertices, effective operators, can give rise to this four point contact interaction. Similarly, for vector boson fusion, we can have many such new diagrams or modifications of old diagrams, which can give rise to uh, corrections in the amplitudes and at the end, the, the cross sections, as well as several angular distributions. So, uh, some of the questions, at least in the context of like collider physics, is like, uh, how do we reconstruct a tera electron volt scale Lagrangian from this data? So why tera elect electron volts? So for now, the, the LHC is running at 13 TeVs. And so that's the energy of the protons. However, the partonic center of mass energy when the proton breaks into partons is a few TeV. And still we have not seen any direct evidence for new physics. So our assumption is that if the physics is like a weak scale physics, it should be at least some, the new physics is at least some tera electron volts. So then we want to know how to extract the best observables in order to study the effects of several operators for some processes. By processes, I mean these, like Higgs produced with W, Higgs produced with two quarks, and by operators, as I said, one can write the, the effective field theory in terms of a series of operators. As I will show you in a few slides is that new vertices can actually come about when one includes effective field theories. So these can give rise to novel or enhanced effects in certain parts of the phase space. One can have uh, enhancements in the high energy tails of distributions and so on and so forth. So one of the most important goals of the LHC was to, was to find the Higgs boson, which is a, it has found the other more important reasons were to find other particles, like for example, supersymmetric particles, uh, particles from uh, extra dimension theories and so on and so forth. But we have not found anything. So somehow the goal has changed. It, it still remains to find new particles. However, the goals have kind of shifted or one, ha one, one cannot discount, like one of the most important goals is to precisely measure these constraints, these couplings. So we want to know how these, how precisely these couplings are with the standard models or deviate from the standard models in order to know whether there are something more. So if history is our guidance, indirect constraints can actually constrain scales to much higher order. So the LEP electron positron collider actually through the oblique parameters, the ST parameters, were able to constrain much higher energy scales than at which they were running. So the LEP collider was running at around 240, 250 giga electron volts. 
However, it could constrain scales to much higher than what it was running at. So for example, LHC at the moment for several physics cases can even constrain scales of up to 10, 20 tera electron volts, even though it's not running at such high energies. So coming to higher dimensional operators. So the properties of higher dimensional operators is that like they are invariant under the standard model gauge group. So this is in the context of standard model effective field theory that I'm talking about. So if you are taking some other theory, then these high dimensional operators should be invariant under that theory's gauge group. So we have operators at different mass dimensions. So here, the lowest mass dimension after standard model is dimension is equal to five. So here one can have a very unique operator. It's called the Majorana mass operator. So it gives rise to the mass of the neutrinos. So one can write this operator and one can get mass of the neutrinos. However, the, the constraint of this operator is that the assumption that neutrinos are Majorana particles. And we do not know yet whether neutrinos are Majorana particles or Dirac particles. At, at dimension six, if we actually assume that baryon number is conserved, there are 59 dimension six operators. I have given the classifications of these, which we, we do not need to be uh, concerned about at the moment. If you're interested, I'll be happy to discuss more. So dimension six operators are the lowest dimension of operators after dimension four, which induces like Higgs couplings to XY particles, XYZ particles, and so on and so forth. We have charged triple gauge couplings at this order. So charged triple gauge couplings means two W bosons interacting with a photon or two W bosons interacting with a Z boson. We can also have dimension seven operators and then we can have dimension eight operators. So dimension eight operators are the lowest dimension operators that gives rise to neutral triple gauge couplings. So for example, in standard model, we do not have couplings like Z, Z, Z or Z gamma gamma or Z, Z gamma. Even at dimension six, we do not have those. However, at dimension eight, effective field theory gives rise to such neutral triple gauge couplings. And this is like quite interesting, yeah. Uh, so we know, for example, that B, there are some accidental symmetries of the standard model like B minus L and if it is gauged, which are yeah. non, uh, no, which do not, which are non anomalous. Yes. So, but, but if, if B minus L, for example, is really gauged, then you cannot, there, there should, should not be such operators that violate B minus L, for example. Yes. Uh, so, so for example, these operators, the, the, those ones I'm talking about do not violate those. So these 59 operators. So there are actually 2,500 such operators and many of those violate those. But these are the class of operators. I should have also written B minus L conserving. These operators also conserve B minus L. Ah, okay. That's yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, but, uh, but, but, but then, if such operators exist, uh, you could so if you, you you can actually find out, for example, whether B minus L is non aluminous or not by studying the effect of such operators. Exactly. So one, one can, for example, for sure. So I have, I have done some studies uh, during my early years of my, uh, of my postdoc. So where we considered such operators in B minus L contexts. And we, uh, so there are, so for example, B, like one, one class of B minus L models uh, give rise to some Z primes. So they, they are the mediators of such models. So one can map these operators into the B minus L model. So there are, Models which which actually pres which which preserve such B minus L symmetries explicitly. So I'm not only talking about the accidental B minus L in standard model, but one has additional B minus L models which in in top on top of standard model. So one can map these operators to standard model. So also they're, they're like I don't know whether I'm like I'm uh, clearly answering your question. So uh, uh, so no, no, yes, yes, you you are. I'm just uh, yeah yeah that's fine. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you could, uh, uh, if the effective field theory could be used as a tool to see uh, whether B minus L is violated or not. Yes, of course. But the thing is that like effective field theory will only tell you like effective field theory will give you some relations, right? So I will show some relations later on. It will give you relations in terms of their Wilson coefficients. And you will know only after you collect a lot of data, whether these relations hold. And then you will be able to say, okay, this this contribution from the effective field theory actually violates uh, B minus L symmetry. This contribution, so if we have like a 
few percent or a few per mil violation of the of the effective fee of the b minus l symmetry so for example we know that standard model has the custodial custodial symmetry and because of the custodial symmetry uh, like some of the operators which actually violate custodial symmetry they are very very strongly coupled uh, very very strongly constrained however they are still allowed at like per mil level so we have constraints on them but they are not essentially zero at least the present data doesn't rule out a complete lack of custodial symmetry we know that they are almost zero with the central value being zero but still it's like zero plus minus 0.0001 so this per mil or per sub mil uh, contamination still is there because of the present data so at the end of the day like like because all of these has to do with data the, the the final numbers that we have have to do a lot with data we will be able to constrain these stronger and stronger like per mil to sub per mil to sub sub per mil but and then we'll actually be able to say okay so this is like 1 in 10 to the power 5 so then we'll be able to say okay this probably is zero and this is just our limitation in data which is not letting us have it to be exactly zero that's that's what i can tell you about and probably the other point that you want to say is that uh, certain kinds of models allow certain certain kinds of operators at some level exactly and so that's how you could even have a test for this models with precision exactly data. exactly so the thing is that yeah that's that's the thing like because we do not know what kind of model we we are looking for like it's like finding a needle in a haystack so we take these operators and we see that some of these operators give us some such excesses then we can actually if we have a class of such operators out of these 59 say we have like six operators and we see that these are these have excesses over over standard model expectations then we try to build a theory where one can have such operators from that model so for example like joydeep chakraborty and others in in iit kanpur they are working on this like it's uh, like they called it a model reparameterization of efts so they take a model they write they they integrate out the the heavy physics they get a set of subset of operators so and one can do it the reverse way one gets some operators and then one can reverse engineer to get a full model so that can also be done so that's where the bottom up and the top down approaches actually mix together and one gets a proper theory one can get a proper theory but it's in the future at the moment so at the moment we want to know whether or not there are excesses at all oh, okay thanks yeah yeah so uh the next question is like we we ask is can the high luminosity lhc compete with the lep for precision physics because we knew that lep was a precision machine whether or not we can actually compete with it whether or not we can gather any new information from the the high luminosity lhc that was not obtained from lep so as we will see that expansion of many of these effective operators actually will show us that even though the higgs was not discovered at the lep however the lep through other measurements could already constrain the higgs so now on hindsight when we have all the data from the lep as well as from the large hadron collider we know that the lep had already indirectly constrained the higgs boson even though it had not discovered it because the same operators can actually give rise to higgs as well as electroweak coupling deformations so can we gain anything new at the high luminosity lhc so we can perhaps by going to very high energies as i'll discuss uh, in in a few slides so as an example i just wanted to show so, you so, sorry shan i'm a bit confused yeah. sure. so the high luminosity lhc there is no increase in energy so i'm by uh, increase in energy i'm going saying that like by going to high energies in the tails of the distribution so as we go to like higher and higher luminosities the high energy tails gather more and more data so we can go high in the energies of these distributions so right now say like if you are looking at a spectrum say an invariant mass of two uh, electrons or two photons uh, then you can say perhaps go to like 1 tev and you see that the data at 1 tev is like very poor and you cannot make any predictions however if you increase the luminosity or the data taking by say uh, 30 times then you have you will have significant amount of statistics and then you will be able to go to high energy bins and then you will be able to make more better pre physics predictions that's what i mean maybe the wording is a bit poor here but that's what i mean like okay, not no, absolute no, no, energy I, 
I understand. So, you, you know, you just have more events with anomalously high PT. Exactly. Uh, and uh, you will build up whether that's an agreement with the standard model fall off or whether it's starting to tick up as you have before. I, 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 I see. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So here I just wanted to give you an example of like what I meant that the, the physics, uh, the Higgs bosons physics was already kind of known when one uh, at the LEP collider, even though the Higgs was not discovered. So let's take an example of a dimension six operator. Let's not go into the semantics and the details of this operator. So we have the Higgs field, we have the W field, we have the B field. So after symmetry breaking, let us expand this operator. So we get the Higgs, the Higgs and we, so we can write the, the various terms as a coupling of the Higgs and two photon fields, Higgs, a photon and a Z field, Higgs with two Z fields, Higgs with two W fields. On top of it, we also get the WW photon, the WWZ interactions, which are called the triple gauge couplings. And we also have the so-called S parameter, which is the WB interaction. So see, I took just one operator and we have seven different deformations from a single operator. So as we'll see that the number of operators that we have and the number of deformations that we have, the number of deformations are much more than the number of operators. So that means that they are very strongly intertwined. They are very strongly correlated. So that's why we need to over constrain our parameter space to be able to constrain all these Wilson coefficients. So one operator can give us seven deformations. Maybe two operators will give us 12 deformations. So we have more deformations than the number of operators. And so if we know something of these deformations, so say for example, the LEP had constrained the WW photon and the WWZ interactions, the triple gauge couplings. The same operator also constrains the Higgs photon, photon, Higgs, Z, Z. So LEP constrained these, but not these directly, but through the effective field theory of formalism, we also have had constraints on these. That's what I wanted to say. So here is the Higgs Lagrangian, which I break up into two parts. So the first part is where the terms are not constrained by LEP. So here we have the Higgs WW interaction. So here, please note that I have, I have made a difference here. It's Higgs W mu plus W mu minus versus the Higgs W mu nu plus W mu nu minus. So this is the structure that exists in standard model and this does not. So we have some terms which are which which one gets from standard model barring this factor here which one can have uh, a modification with respect to standard model then we have the higgs self coupling we have the higgs u cover interaction with two fermions we have the effective higgs coupling with two gluons effective higgs coupling with two photons and effective field higgs coupling with a photon and a z boson so these following terms are not constrained by LEP and for the first time probed at the Large Hadron Collider. In contrast, however, we have some terms which were constrained by the LEP through the effective operator formalism. So for example, we have this custodial symmetry violating term, Higgs ZZ. So in standard model, this relation actually follows the custodial symmetry. So we have the row parameter, which is one in standard model. However, the experiments measures it to be one plus minus 0.001 or 0.0001. So this allows for this custodial symmetry breaking term. Then we can have a fermion current where one can have a Higgs ZFF, which is like a four point interaction. One can have a Higgs F, F prime W, which is another four point interaction. Then one can have the Higgs WW and the Higgs ZZ couplings but with different Lorentz structures. So these are the terms that were constrained by LEP. So now just taking the second part of the Lagrangian that I to told you about, how one can write these in terms of other couplings. So if one follows the expansions in the effective field theory, one can write the delta H ZZ in terms of the delta G1Z and the delta kappa gamma. So these are two triple gauge couplings and have nothing to do with Higgs. So these are the relations that come from the operators. And the LEP was able to constrain these couplings separately and didn't do anything about it. Now that we know that the Higgs exists, this relation makes complete sense. And we can actually have the constraints that LEP gave on Higgs data as well. Similarly, we have this four point interaction. The four point interaction can be written in terms of the Z decaying to a pair of fermions, which is called the Z pole. 
then we have the triple the triple gauge couplings so we have various relations at lep which actually could constrain the the higgs physics even though we didn't discover the higgs so this is the prowess and the power of the effective field theory formalism such that we can actually relate couplings to other couplings so so now the thing is that we have these relations right and we want to measure or constrain the left hand side and the right hand side separately so that actually was like jim's one of jim's questions was like why do we need to constrain these so well and why do we need to constrain or what's the rationale behind these so we want to see whether these relations hold after say the the finishing of the run of the lhc or even some future colliders so now we would expect that if everything holds that if one of these then everything is fine however if one of these predictions is not confirmed then we can have some serious ramifications one of the most like really threatening ramifications is that our, like our assumption is that higgs is a part of the of a doublet may be false it can be something else it can be part of a bigger gauge group so we do not know so at the moment our whole assumption of the effective field theory formalism here the demand writing this, these operators is that higgs is a part of a doublet the second reasoning can be that these relations are written order by order like dimension 6 dimension 8 and so on and so forth so here the relations i have written down are at dimension 6 so it's also it, it may also be possible that dimension 6 operators are not enough to capture this whole thing and we may need dimension 8 operators or operators at higher order so that like we can actually we can actually miss match the mismatch that we get from data uh but uh, so, shankar can i ask something uh, yes so uh, so in this, this is this is always a pitfall right you can always say that if something is not working uh, according to predictions of eft you can always say it's some higher dimensional operator effect you know and you have some uh, so 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 is, isn't that always a, a kind of threat to uh, uh, yeah. uh, to, to to this yeah it's it's actually a very good question on the so the thing is that for most of the cases that we see uh, uh, for effective field theory so for dimension 6 also because the the operators we write as some c by lambda squared terms times operator right so our total term is standard model plus the c by lambda squared times operator whole squared so when we write down the squared the, when we write down the squared matrix element we get the standard model piece the interference piece which goes as c by lambda squared and then a squared piece which goes as c squared by lambda to the power 4 right so in most of our expectations what we see here is that the squared piece is much 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 smaller than the linear piece so the linear piece is way more dominating than the squared piece so at least until now we have not come across any such scenarios where the squared piece is dominant and then we would need to go to another higher dimension so depending on the high energy scale so if the high energy scale is of a few tev we cannot go go on indefinitely like even the physics wise we should but at some point the the term start to like completely vanish so the, the what if something happens is that like the squared piece is comparable to the linear piece then we need to take the the next higher order operator where we need to have the interference piece of the dimension 8 which is the same order as the squared piece as the linear piece as uh, as the dimension 6 term so it's highly unlikely that such things will happen because we already have very good agreement at dimension 6 level only a few few such operators only a few such processes especially loop processes give us slightly different contributions and also there are many more uh, like uh, interesting physics that i'm not going into we also need to take into account next to leading order correction so if one is doing the physics at completely leading order there can be some uh, some things which which one might miss so it's very important that we go to like higher order corrections not just in terms of effective field theories but also in terms of uh, higher order calculations in in the loop diagrams so that's also very important so that that's that's something that we we also do but your question is well taken and people are aware of this but at the moment people have not seen this Uh, to be uh, any serious problem for the processes that have been considered till date to date yes so it's just a is just a hope that uh, this this will yeah yeah but then then again like as i said before effective field theories aim is not to replace any model so 
it will at least give us a signature okay this these kinds of processes or these kinds of relations actually give us some access so one can then look into future models or new models which actually actually look into these so this is something that one one needs to look at but at the yeah. moment we do not have much handle over anything else we are not seeing any new new physics through uh, new models so the precision physics is one of the best bet at the moment that we have in terms of collider physics yeah but we, we some uh, this is where differential distributions are going to become very important right exactly because, exactly because the absolute may not show you anything but once you look differentially yeah. you 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 know there, there's exactly. a hit, there's a big history of this so you you know this is what what you go to next more than but you need more data to go differential exactly so. exactly so i'll be so. talking about differential distributions in, in a while like uh, I, i might like skip some technical slides to to facilitate the discussion so uh, this is nothing important for us this is like sensitivity at high energy colliders so here i basically show the lagrangian that one can write uh, to to encapsulate like the higgs strahlung process that i talked about the weak boson fusion and the gluon fusion so here see i have like marked terms in like blue red and black so the blue terms are essentially the ones which exist in standard model however they can uh, they can encounter deviations uh, through effective operators the red terms are the ones which occur because they have no propagators and they uh, they basically essentially grow with energy so i showed this this graph before so these are the terms for example so they do not grow with they they grow with energy because they have no propagators so these are the red terms and here we have the black terms which do not the, the these lorentz structures are completely new and do, they do not arise in standard model at all so the, these are completely new and as jim was pointing out differential distributions are the best bet to constrain such such couplings because when lorentz structure changes we do not just have a rescaling uh, of the total rate as these terms do but we have a change in the angular distributions so this is again some some uh, semantics so here are various operators so there are many bases so this is called the warsaw bases because it was developed in the warsaw university so these are some of the upper dimension 6 operators that that contribute to the higgs strahlung processes and the weak boson fusion processes i'm not going into details because there's nothing that we we can learn in such a short time with these operators and these are the operators for the gluon fusion process where the higgs decays to four leptons so there are like 18 other 18 operators for each of these processes now coming to jim's point so differential in energy and angles so say for example we take the example of pp proton proton going to a gauge boson and a higgs and the gauge boson decays to a pair of leptons so we have the two we have the beam axis we have two protons they collide and we have a higgs and a z boson or a w boson so here we define an angle which is the scattering angle in the center of mass frame of the v8 system and then this v decays to a pair of leptons and it has an angle of theta so this theta is again defined in the center of mass frame of the v and then we have this angle phi which is the angle between these two planes the plane formed by the v lepton lepton and the plane formed by this h v the beam axis so these are the three angles that uh, are of concern so one can write down the total cross section as a quartic differential as d sigma de d big theta d small theta and d phi so it's essentially a very differential information that one can extract so if it's a three body phase space as one can see like higgs decaying to a fat jet and the v decaying to a pair of leptons so we have three final states so for a three body phase space one can write the kinematics in terms of five kinematic observables so this five kinematic observables also includes the boost factor which we can calculate so if we if we exclude the boost factor there are essentially four variables the square root of s which is the energy and these three angles so if we essentially consider 10 bins per variable so then we have for every single energy bin we have 10 times 10 times 10 which is like 1000 numbers to obtain the full information so that's a huge amount of data huge amount of resource that we need to know in order to know something however this can be reduced to 9 per energy bin as we will see very shortly 
So, so, so sorry, I had a question here. This yeah. is maybe it's a more experimental one, but sure. you you have the fat jet, right? Which yeah. presumably would be Higgs to BB bar. Yes, that's predominant, the case, yeah. predominantly. Yeah. Uh, that, that, but that's rather tricky to reconstruct, right? Yes, that's what we do actually. Yes. So, 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 but why not? I guess it's because the cross section is uh, the branching fraction is so large that you want mm -hmm. to do this. But there's a real experimental challenge, right, to try and identify the Higgs to the fat jet on this side, and you're yes. going to have backgrounds from standard model stuff. Yes, yes. From so just that... single Z production. Exactly. Things. Exactly. So, so that's what we do here. So we do a full analysis where we consider a substructure of these fat jets. I was not going into these details. Okay. So we consider fat jet substructure and we consider all the backgrounds. For example, as you pointed out, the dominant background comes from ZZ. So the Z going to BB bar and the other Z going to a pair of leptons. And we do it very carefully. So essentially we, we are also trying to take another angle here, which would be the angles with the uh, with the two subjects. So here we'll have the two B subjects and one can actually take another angle theta prime and then one can have a D theta prime to extract more information. However, it's like not very easy at the moment because for leptons, it's fairly straightforward as you can, as you know, the charges of these leptons, it's very hard to, to get the charge information for fat jets, at least to a very good precision like leptons. It's doable. But at the moment, like flavor tag is one thing, charge tagging these tracks, it's possible, but it's, it's somewhat more involved and like need, needs a lot of experimental knowledge to, to do it. So yeah, but, all but, the but, analysis, yeah. But Sorry. presumably to do this kind of thing, future E plus E minus colliders would have a much easier time. Exactly. But, exactly. but I know the, the numbers are less, so I, I'm, I'm you know, they're not producing as many Higgs as the yes, LHC exactly. work. So it's a trade-off, but... Right. Okay. Okay. So I'll, right. I'll the we, idea. Are doing an, we are doing an E plus E minus study, which is similar to this. The thing is that the, the reason for studying the, the... We need to study both the PP collider as well as the E plus E minus collider, because we are trying to constrain operators, which are Higgs Z or Higgs V F F bar. So the FF bar can either be quarks, which can be probed at the PP colliders, or can be leptons, which can be probed at lepton colliders. So both of these need to be done. Both of these have their advantages as well as disadvantages. So, but both of the, to understand the effective field theory formalism, it's imperative that we study at both these colliders. Yeah, no, they I, are I, different. They are different couplings. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. So these are some relations in the that that relates these deformations to to uh, the to Wilson coefficients of the effective operators that I'm not going into details. These are some effective space directions uh, that actually give us like at what quantities or in which directions one can actually constrain these effective field theory couplings. So if I had more time, I would have gone through more details. So let me quickly go to, so th these are like to, un to answer to Ayunda's question once. So I'm now being a bit sketchy because I don't have a lot of time. Uh, the, so I, can you please tell me how much time I have in total from now? Ayunda, you're muted. I can't hear you. Oh, sorry, sorry. It's 15 to 20, 20 minutes. Okay, yeah. sure. So I will be fast now. So as Ayunda was actually saying that, uh, uh, like, uh, the how about higher energy corrections? Uh, how about higher order corrections from effective operators? So we also have, like, high higher order corrections from next to leading order uh, uh, corrections from QCD as well as electroweak physics. So here we can see that this was a study done by Grayo and others. So there are, they have some effective field theory benchmarks and they plotted for the Z Higgs, the W Higgs, the weak boson fusion, and for various effective field theory vertices, the uh, benchmarks, they calculated the next to leading order corrections. So as you can see that there are next to leading order corrections of the order of like five to 10%. So these also need to be taken into account while doing these studies. So now coming to Jim's point. So I just wanted to say very quickly. So here we did a full analysis uh, where we did the differential in energy. So we studied the PP going to Z Higgs, going to two leptons plus BB bar. We considered all these backgrounds like the Z Higgs standard model, Z BB bar, TT bar, the fake backgrounds and so on and so forth. 
we did a cut paste as well as a boosted decision tree analysis and we actually found that uh, with mv optimization one can one can actually get uh, the signal over background to half which is a pretty big feat and one can actually constrain these uh, couplings pretty well so i was telling you before that like because so, there so, are sorry could you i I'm just interested in the details so sure sure jim yeah okay so in 300 inverse femto bonds you'd have in 300 inverse femto bond we'll actually have like close to uh, 35 standard model zh events okay. so which okay. is which is pretty good uh, and we have like a half optimization like close to 70 background events so yeah oh, okay so, okay. so that's pr promising for the quite HLLSE, promising. yeah exactly exactly yeah so previously i was saying that like we would require a lot of variables like here i said that like we will require like thousand numbers per bin to obtain full information because we have like these four variables so per energy bin 10 times 10 times 10 if we had 10 bins per variable however physics is very nice and we can essentially write down all of these so this is the vh that i was showing before and this is the gluon fusion where the angles are slightly different the higgs decaying to a pair of z bosons one on shell one off shell and four leptons one can write these uh, terms the whole amplitude in terms of nine beautiful uh, angular distributions so one can write so we have longitudinal longitudinal transverse transverse longitudinal transverse one can write these in terms of nine angular structures which are independent from each other and one can essentially instead of thousand one can one needs to essentially probe these nine structures and one will know everything about uh, these two processes so uh, now just now i'm just going like differential in energy and then i'll be talking in differential in in angles by going to differential in energy we studied the Z, Z Higgs process that Jim was asking a bit before. And we, because we, I showed you that all these couplings are correlated, one can actually plot this, the whole spectrum in terms of the gauge boson cup, the weak boson couplings, the triple couplings. So these are a bit small. So this is Delta G one Z, which is the coupling of the W W and the Z. And this is the Delta Kappa gamma, which is the coupling between the two W's and the photon. So one can see here, that through Goldstone boson equivalence, many of these processes are like strongly intertwined. Like WZ, Z Higgs, VVF, they are all intertwined. So at LEP colliders, they could give a constraint, which is this gray blob area. And at LHC, one can actually constrain these couplings even more strongly. So WZ was done by another group by Franceschini et al. Z Higgs and W Higgs were done by us and VVF also by us. So what one can see is that because of Goldstone boson equivalence, because these are all strongly intertwined, one can put an overall constraint by studying all these channels. And at the end of the three Atoban inverse run, this green sliver is what will remain. And one will be able to constrain this triple gauge coupling parameter space in terms of only this green sliver. So here I am just giving a progression of how the constraints can improve from LEP, which was what already done, our high luminosity LHC projection at 300 inverse femtobarn and three atobarn inverse. And if one goes to like even high energy colliders like an FCCHH, which is now uh, under the cards like 100 TeV. So one can see that the constraints actually can improve by orders of magnitude upon going from LEP to uh, 14 TeV high luminosity LHC to 100 TV. Even 14 TV colliders give us extremely important and extremely uh, improved constraints from what LEF had done. So because I was talking about the Goldstone boson equivalence and how these channels are all intertwined. So here you see weak boson fusion, Z Higgs production, W Higgs production, and WZ production. They all depend on the same set of operators. So from the, and we get we get relations or linear blind directions from each process by putting constraints. From, from weak boson future, uh, fusion, one has constraint on these couplings, CQ1, CQ3, CUR, and CDR. If you are interested later on, I can discuss what couplings these are, but just believe me that these are the couplings which contribute to all these processes. For Z Higgs, we get a complementary direction. For WH and ZH, for WH and WZ, 
Unfortunately, both of these probe the same direction. So we have four channels and we have four couplings. However, the last two probe the same direction. So we want a fifth direction, which we are studying now, which is the WW production, which will be able to help this degeneracy. And one will be able to put individual constraints on all these couplings instead of linear blind directions. So that's what we want to constrain. We want to constrain these individual couplings separately. Now, differential in angles. So here I had shown these various nine angular structures. Now, these angular structures also come with coefficients. So these are the coefficients for the Z Higgs process. So we have the, left, the, the longitudinal, longitudinal, the transverse, transverse, and so on. So these terms can be written as the standard model piece plus the effective field theory piece, pieces. So we get these nine structures. And then we can use angular variables to constrain these. So here, for example, if we want to constrain some operators like these ALT2 and ALT2 tilde, so to constrain this kappa WW or kappa ZZ that I was talking, talking to you about. So we have these terms and that's the pickle here. So we have terms like cosine phi sine two theta sine two big theta and sine phi sine two theta sine two big theta. So these are terms of the squared matrix element. Now we know that if we integrate over any of these three angles, because these are not squared terms, but they are linear in these sinusoidal, this, these trigonometric functions, they will essentially vanish. So we, we won't be able to put any constraints because once we, once we integrate about, uh, over any of these three angles, these terms will completely vanish. So how do we probe these couplings like kappa zz and kappa zz tilde? So there's a simplified approach that we did in one of the earlier papers is that we have an asymmetry and we flip the signs in the regions to always maintain positive sine two theta sine two big theta. And there's a sophisticated approach that has been known, known in the flavor sector for a long time that we now used in this, this context is the method of moments, which is like a Fourier expansion, which I'm not going into details right now. So by using these method of moments, one actually helps in preserving these, these terms and one can constrain these couplings very well. So we get an expected cosine phi, phi as well as a sine phi distribution for CP even and CP odd cases. So these are the distributions one gets for CP even and CP odd cases. So we also saw that the leading order theoretical shapes that we get and the next to leading order that we get uh, and effects of radiation, showering, experimental cuts, et cetera, we saw everything and the shapes remain quite robust even after the introduction of these different uh, uh, modifications, different cuts, radiations, et cetera. So here I just wanted to show very quickly uh, the constraints that we obtained on these various couplings uh, the, the angular couplings. So here we use this sophisticated method of moments approach, which is a very simple and a very simple approach that is like one can see what's going on. And there are many approaches like which are like neural networks, which one which are to many physicists like blind boxes, black boxes. So one can constrain these couplings to like per cent or per mill levels, as one can see, and we get constraints which are comparable to this famous Mela bounds, which is the matrix element uh, bounds. And one can constrain limits to the, the contact interactions to per, per mill level, and one can constrain the, the kappa ZZ and the delta HZZ to percent level at the high luminosity LHC. So that these are the bounds one, one will actually have one when one goes to the high luminosity LHC. And by combining with gluon fusion, one can get an even stronger bound, the VH and the Higgs to four lepton, one can get an even stronger bound. So now I like in few minutes, I'll very quickly talk about like Higgs trilinear self coupling. So we can have the, so we can have the Higgs Higgs production, the Higgs Higgs plus a jet production, and the Higgs Higgs plus a top top production. So these are the various cross sections for the di Higgs production. One can have glue glue to two Higgs, QQ bar to Higgs Higgs, QQ bar, and so on. And these are some of the Feynman diagrams that one will be interested in to probe the various couplings. So one of the most interesting couplings that people want to probe is this Higgs self coupling, the Higgs 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 triple coupling that will give us uh, a, a, an indication to what we know about the, the, the scalar potential. So the understanding the scalar potential is extremely important uh, to our understanding of the standard model, whether or not we 
measure everything else to, to, to very precise measurements, we still need to know it because we need to know the nature of the electroweak symmetry breaking, the nature of the electroweak phase transition, and so on and so forth. And Dye-Higgs actually provides the only direct means to probe this self-coupling. There are indirect means as well through radiative corrections. However, those give weaker couplings, uh, weaker constraints. One of the most challenging tasks, like in contrast to single Higgs production is that because of an unfortunate uh, destructive interference between the, the box diagram and this triangle diagram, one has an essentially a very small cross section of the order of 40 femtobarns at 14 TeV. And uh, this is very small cross section and we haven't yet imposed the branching fractions here. So, uh, at the LHC uh, or at 100 TeV colliders, it's actually possible to constrain these couplings to order between five to 10%. And it's very important to have the control over systematics. So now I'm not going into the BSM sector of the heavy Higgs. There can be enhancement of the production cross section. There can be exotic decay modes of the, of the, through the die Higgs production. I have worked on some of these myself. So I'm not going into those. So this is essentially the present status of the the Dihigs production through from CMS as well as Atlas production uh, 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 collaborations, and one sees that the strongest constraint that one has is from the 4B channel from Atlas collaboration, uh, and uh, these are the constraints uh, that that one has from present data, and one needs to know uh, whether these will exactly be following the standard model expectations in in near future. So these are a set of operators. There are six, seven operators which give rise to, uh, sorry, six operators which give rise to the, the double X productions. And one can use, use equations of motions, uh, custodial symmetry, and one is essentially left with these four operators. So I'm not going into very, very great details. I can discuss later if you're interested. So here we essentially, I did many studies on double X production. So this is a study with people from IISC and uh, from Kolkata. And uh, we studied the Higgs in the, the double Higgs production as non-resonantly produced in these 11 channels. And we put constraints on them. The strongest constraint came from the di photon plus the di B channel. And there were other channels like the double B and the double W, which were also quite uh, significant. And one essentially got uh, uh, like the cleanest channel to, to be the BB gamma gamma and a combined significance came to be around three sigma. So one still, and this is like combining all these channels. So it's still far from, we are still far from uh, measuring the Higgs triple coupling. So like, and we really need to, to understand it. So uh, to, to, to set the stage for another thing. So we studied like with, with my collaborators from Durham and CERN, I studied like, what if one adds one extra jet with the die, die Higgs? So one essentially gets a Pentagon diagram. And by having this extra jet, one can essentially uh, disentangle the di Higgs invariant mass from the PT Higgs spectrum. So the PT Higgs spectrum and the di Higgs invariant mass in the just the double Higgs production are correlated. But one, when one has a third particle, a single jet, one can actually decorrelate it. And one can use this channel to put constraints on the Higgs triple coupling to be of the order of 8%, which is a very big feat. But remind you that these constraints are at the future uh, FCC HH collider. One can also constrain these from another process like the TT Higgs Higgs process and the constraints are weaker. However, the plan now is to do a full global analysis considering all double Higgs production channels and one will be able to put very strong constraints then. So it's, it's an involved study that I am now a part, a part of. So I'll just take like a few minutes to just talk about dark matter in the universe so we know that of uh, like close to 80% of the matter that we have uh, is dark matter. And uh, we do not have any particle physics, uh, 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 particle physics uh, 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 knowledge about dark matter. And only we know about it from astrophysical experiments and gravitational interactions through galaxy clusters, through galaxy rotation curves, through cosmic microwave background radiation, gravitational lensing, and so on. So what we know about it till now is that it's electrically neutral, even though there are some studies about milli charged particles that I'm not going into. It is cold in nature or warm at best, and it's collision less because it forms structure and hence neutrinos fail this criteria and baryons are not strongly favored. Uh, uh, we, Uncle, yeah. uh, actually, I'm very sorry, but 
maybe it is better if you end in 2 minutes and we can have a discussion a short and then sure continue. okay so i just uh, will skip the dark matter part then so dark matter has a lot of uh, potential and we can like study it in direct detection indirect detection collider experiments and we can have several models for example pseudo scalar mediated dark matter models we can have the weakly interacting dark matter particles the feebly interacting dark matter particles asymmetric dark matter multi component dark matter there are a plethora of ways in which one can study dark matter so also like it's it's very important that like we know of relic abundance which is one of the most important things for dark matter however how well we actually measure it in a in a model is very important so we took the example because from planck experiments the 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 relic abundance is very well known so how well do we measure it becomes very important so so we took an example model a very simple model called the inert higgs doublet model and we computed the relic abundance at next to leading order and we saw that we can get very strong corrections because of the next to leading order corrections uh, so it's very it's very important that when we talk about like uh, dark matter models or many bsm models one should actually uh, be hesitant to make any conclusive statements before one takes into account higher order corrections so these are examples of more and this is long live particles so essentially at the moment we have overwhelmingly majority of particles which are being searched for either for heavy mass and very small lifetime or very stable particles however a large part of the particles could be somewhere here and we need to invest more resources into probing this part of the parameter space so this is my uh, summary and conclusions that effective field theories are very important we need to constrain couplings to greater and greater precision we need to constrain higgs couplings to percent or per mill level or even better we need to understand the triple higgs coupling in the higgs scalar potential dark matter physics is extremely important at the moment and uh, uh, long lived particles are something that should be studied very well so a lot of new physics to explore in the coming years so i leave you to this cute slide okay very good thanks for this very nice talk shanko we really learned a lot um, thank you so uh, so jim has left so maybe i get a little bit uh, more courage to ask this question then so <laughs> the question is that uh, we see this left and non universality this report of that and uh, yeah uh, coming from this uh, b mason d case yeah. so so some of these things could also affect uh, other maybe not the higgs or double higgs productions but maybe some other things that we can measure in other type of experiments so from the point of view effective field theory yeah. uh, what are these other processes that one could look for or yeah. what could be other ways to test this left and non universality exactly it's a very good question ayunda so the thing is that at the moment the 59 operators that i told told you about they are not only just b conserving or b minus l conserving but they also assume left on flavor universality see universality so the thing is that uh, there are if we if we break each of these so like if we demand that okay uh, so right now like it re it requires that the modifications of say higgs u cover to a pair of tau leptons is the same as the higgs u cover to a pair of mu leptons or electrons so we modify everything by the same factor so uh, there are studies which have been done uh, in weitzman and other places where people looked into lepton non universality in in such cases and the only thing is that because we are in a shortage of data at the moment and we also know that know that like because uh, the higgs couplings to electrons are like so small in standard model because it's the u cover is proportional to the mass of the lepton or the mass of the fermion so it's almost impossible to probe the higgs to electrons directly however we can probe the higgs to muons directly so the test that that you you are suggesting is that for at least for the higgs sector we can know the higgs coupling to a pair of taus to a pair of muons we do the we fit the data with a lepton universal eft scenario and we fit the data with a lepton non universal scenario and we see which fit fits better which gives us the better uh, the, the better constraints the stronger constraints so that's the only thing that i can think of at the moment because there's no reason that uh, the, like uh, the universality will be like completely uh, universal so one can have like non universal sector in the leptons but maybe not in the quarks like it probably it's a bit too early to say this but 
uh, there are EFT studies which have already been done, which which uh, probes this. So also there is one more thing, like when like when we are talking about like say I gave an example of proton proton going to Z Higgs, where the Z decays to a pair of leptons and the Higgs decays to a fat jet. So here is the uh, if you remember this is the plot that I was showing you. Uh, yeah, so so these leptons here, the operator that I considered are lepton universal. Uh, so if I put lepton non-universal uh, things, what will happen is that I will have more uh, more operators here. So I will have two more operator um, uh, uh, Wilson coefficients uh, uh, contributing, and these we will need more measurements to disentangle them completely. So right now, like four or five measurements will help us in disentangling these, uh, and then we'll have like the more the number of couplings, the more the number of uh, processes that we'll uh, need to uh, study to disentangle these. So that's uh, the ramification of uh, this. But I completely agree with you, like lepton non-universal universality is already seen in the flavor sector at the moment, like the LHCB results that was shown a few days ago, they talk about lepton non-universality. So uh, at, the, at, the, at the present, the, in the Higgs gate sector, it is not so pronounced or has not been seen. Because if you remember, there was an uproar like few years ago where um, the, the one people were studying like CMS and Atlas as some excess in Higgs uh, flavor violating decays, like Higgs decaying to a tau and a muon instead of two taus, or a muon and an, and an electron, or a tau and an electron. So right now the, the 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 new data has like subsided, and one doesn't see that excess, but that could have been a possibility. And and those do not, like those are also outside those fifty nine operators. So we need to expand our operator space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of things to do indeed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the Higgs portal, the Higgs uh, phenomenology is already uh, super rich, as you are saying, if you look into differential cross sections. And exactly. Other things. Exactly. Like, yeah. there, there can be a lot like, of things uh, done. Like, only these two processes have like so much information, like all these information. Yeah, that's so, amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, like, that's the that's more we do, nice. So I just wanted to show you like in one slide what I mean by this method of moments because I didn't have a chance to uh, show it. So the method of moments is essentially one writes the amplitude squared in terms of some angular functions. And essentially one looks for weight functions similar to like Fourier expansions. And one can write down this matrix in terms of, one can write down this weight matrix like this and this weight matrix varies process to process. So the good thing about this is that like one knows everything about this thing here. Like if one is doing a neural network or a multivariate analysis, like you just plug in something, you get back something, but the physics is not transparent at all. But if you are doing it this way, you can see ev at every step like what, and we are getting exactly the same bounds as they are getting uh, through this uh, multivariate analysis. So that's something that we felt really good about. You could decode which operator could lead to excesses. Or things exactly, like that. exactly, that we can do, yeah. Yeah, it was a very, very good talk and it was very nice, but unfortunately we are short yeah, of time. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I like I went overboard. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks again. It was great. Thank you. It was very good. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so talk to you later again. Yeah, yeah, talk to you later. Have a good week. Have a good week. Yeah, you too. Yeah. Uh,